May 1950, Vicky Tawil stepped into the ring and into history. In only his 14th professional fight, he would be facing Manuel Ortiz, a veteran of 111 fights, 21 of those being world title bouts for the bantamweight championship of the world. I never got nervous from a world title fight, but when Vicky fought, I was so nervous, you can't believe it. I was so frightened. But I kept walking around and praying, asking the sacred Lord, Jesus to help us here, please, you know, because it's, it's a world title fight, and I was just praying. I promise you, I was walking around. I'm a Catholic. I had the rosary. I kept on walking around saying the rosary while the fight was on. In those days, you can appreciate there weren't as many sanctioning bodies as there are today. So in order to get a title shot, you had to be the best. He was an exceptional fighter. You know, I remember once at a weigh-in uh, where, he, where the doctor took his uh, pulse, and it was something like 46. And the doctor said to him, Tawil, if you go any lower, you'll be going backwards. But uh, that's something he could never do. He was a constant attacker. He moved forward. He threw punches the whole time. And I think that's what really electrified the crowd, because he could throw punches nonstop, both hands, body, head, the lot. He was always on the move. There was never a dull moment when he was in the ring. I was a boxer, but I wasn't a crowd pleaser like my brother Vicky. Vicky was a fighter, and Vicky would make everybody feel great. Me, I was boxing, they'd give a guy a boxing lesson, boom, boom, move around and give him a hiding. But Vicky would like rip into the body and, and ex it would be an exciting fight. Until the crowd took to Vicky. Vicky was the biggest draw this country ever had, even to this day. World Bantamweight Champion. Vicky was regarded as a rank underdog by all except his family when going into battle against the legendary Ortiz. But as the fight progressed, it became clear that he had every intention of laying claim to the mantle of being the best bantamweight in the world. Starting his competitive career at the age of nine, Vicky had a total of 300 amateur fights, losing only two. One being a very controversial loss at the 1948 Olympic Games in London. The decision was severely criticized by ringside reporters and authorities as it was deemed that the judges had made a mistake with regard to the identities of the two fighters. As a senior amateur, Vicky had taken part in 190 bouts and scored a phenomenal 160 knockouts. Vicky won the national bantamweight title in his fourth professional fight and then beat the highly rated Tony Lombard for the national featherweight title a few bouts later. Lombard had just beaten the British Empire featherweight champion Ronnie Clayton in a non-title fight. Clayton now refused to face the sensational South African. Stan Rowan, the Empire bantamweight champion, was however prepared to defend his title against Vicky. Although a natural featherweight, the Tawil camp made the fateful decision to keep Vicky's weight down and he would fight as a bantam. Well, Vicky won the Empire title with ease, and it was that victory which put him in line for a shot against Manuel Ortiz's world crown. In the short space of 17 months after turning professional, Vicky had won two national titles, the Empire title, and was now in reach of realizing a dream against the odds. Ortiz lost the world bantamweight title to Harold Dade in January 1947. In a rematch, three months later, Ortiz scored a unanimous 15-round decision over Dade to regain the coveted title. Since regaining the world title, Ortiz has defended it four times. This is Manuel's second fight this year. In a non-title bout just three months ago, Ortiz took a hard-fought 10-round decision over former world bantamweight champion Harold Dade. Both men enjoy working in close. Sharp punches by both fighters. A great ring close-up of the action. Wheel pouring it on. Sharp, crisp punching by champion Manuel Ortiz. Ortiz is trying to take the play away. In slow motion, let's take a look at that action once again. The wheel comes in with a crisp left. And then followed by a right. All to wheel.
Ortiz decides to come back strong. A combination of three punches by champion Manuel Ortiz. A rugged right to the body. Lightning punches by champion Manuel Ortiz. They're all finding their mark. In normal action now, challenger Vic Tuil comes right back. Both of these men throwing bombs. In slow motion, let's take a look at that action once again. Champion Manuel Ortiz with back to camera. Victor Wheel stepping back to measure his man. Back in normal action here at the end of round three. And there's the bell ending the round. Rounds four and five were hard fought and very close. Here in round six, neither fighter has an edge. Challenger Vic Tawil in the dark trunks with white stripe had a brilliant amateur career. Vic had 190 fights as an amateur, losing only two decisions, scoring 160 knockouts. Vic began his ring career professionally in 1949, just last year. In 13 fights, Vic is undefeated, scoring six knockouts. In only his fourth fight, Dewey won the South African Bantamweight title. In November, just six months ago, Vic took a 15-round decision from Stan Rowan to win the British Empire Bantamweight title. A dynamite barrage by Vic Tuil. He's after that World Bantamweight Championship. Both fighters going all out. And there's the bell ending the round. In slow motion, let's take another look at that action. Challenger Vic Tuil backs Ortiz into the ropes. Short, snappy punches by Vic Tuil. Victor Wheel pouring it on. A dynamite barrage. Vic is trying to take the play away from Manuel Ortiz. Sharp body punches by Ortiz and a right to the head. But Vic comes fighting back. There's the end of the round. Manuel Ortiz won round seven and eight. Vic Tuil came back and gave his hometown fans something to cheer for by winning rounds nine, 10, and 11. Here in round 12, Vic appears to be slightly ahead in the scoring. In his last fight just seven weeks ago, Tuil took a close, hard-fought 15-round decision from Fernando Gagnon in defense of his British Empire Bantamweight title. Here in round 12, both men still going strong. Rapier left jab by Vic Tuil as we see this great close-up. And there's the bell ending the round. The fighters touch gloves here at the beginning of the 15th and final round. Ortiz won round 13 by a slim margin. Vic Tuil scored frequently with good body punches to win round 14. Here in the 15th and final round, challenger Vic Tuil appears to be ahead in the scoring.
Both fighters trying to pull it out here in the 15th round. And there's the bell ending the fight. The two fighters affectionately hug each other to show there are no hard feelings. The judges give the decision and the World Bantamweight Championship to young Vic Tuil. The dethroned champion, Manuel Ortiz, put on a marvelous demonstration of what a true champion is made of, but gave away just too many years to the younger Vic Tuil. Tuil's handlers are elated as they congratulate their fighter on his championship performance. Vic proved to his hometown fans that his boxing ability deserved the world title honor. Manuel Ortiz graciously congratulates the newly crowned champion, Vic Tuil, bantamweight champion of the world. That fight meant so much because immediately after that, it evoked so much interest in professional boxing. That started the era of boxing in, the early, in, in those early years. And today we reap the benefits because Vicky proved everybody wrong. If, in fact, if I recall correctly, the then governor of the day actually paid tribute to him, stopped the proceedings and actually paid tribute to that magnificent win. And the world took cognizance of South African boxing because it was a very, very great win. The fight itself, one of the two greatest fights this country's ever seen. I think it still rates as one of the greatest world title fights ever. Magnificent bout. To me, that was one of the greatest accomplishments ever in South African boxing history. To prepare for his first defense of his title against the number one challenger, Danny O'Sullivan, Vicky defeated Alvaro Nuvaloni and the All-Ireland Bantamweight champion Bunty Doran in non-title bouts. Both of these bouts were fought outside the Bantamweight limit as Vicky was already struggling to keep his weight down. In order to do so, he would train in the midday sun wearing a tracksuit made of blankets. Comedian Tommy Trinder was introduced from the ring. After a friendly handshake and best wishes to Danny O'Sullivan, his fellow countryman, he shook hands with the world champion and the fight was on. Round one, and O'Sullivan comes out... At the time of the O'Sullivan fight, Vicky's brother Morris took over the reins as the world champion's manager from his father. He accepted this challenge at the meagre age of 20 and went on to establish himself as one of the greatest managers and promoters in South African boxing history. O'Sullivan, who'd been vying to get a crack at Manuel Ortiz before Vicky dethroned him, was completely outgunned by the champion, who proved himself in a different league to the number one challenger. Vicky started characteristically slowly, checking out his opponent, and then went about dismantling him with veritable ease, dropping him a record number of 14 times in 10 rounds. Setting himself for his punches. He may not possess a quick knockout punch, but they hurt and there are hundreds of them. O'Sullivan's counter blows immediately started to fall short and the pattern was set by the end of round three. So far the scorecards and spectators found little to separate the two fighters. But when the little Londoner came up for the fourth, he found a very different Tawil waiting for him. Cool and businesslike, the world champion goes to work. A right and a left drives O'Sullivan to the ropes. Danny holds on to avoid punishment. Tawil looks for an opening, but O'Sullivan comes back at him, and the fight moves to the center of the ring. Tawil scores on the infighting, then drives O'Sullivan back to the ropes. He's in trouble as the South African follows up his advantage and measures him up with his left as he slams in his right. The Londoner's in trouble, and down he goes. But almost before the count is started, he rises to his feet wipes off his gloves and boxes on. From now on, it's all Tawil, and soon he has O'Sullivan back on the ropes. The Londoner pulls out every trick in the book to get away, but Tawil chases him round the ring and drops him for the second time. Again, O'Sullivan refuses the advantage of taking a count, a little foolhardy perhaps, and Tawil once more moves in on his weakened opponent. Suddenly, following a right cross as he's off balance, the champion goes down on his knee, but he's up in a flash to send O'Sullivan to the canvas. O'Sullivan takes a rest until the gong closes round six. In round eight, Vic Tawil, in murderous mood, battered O'Sullivan at will. But again, he didn't stay down for long. Tawil slammed away, and only tremendous courage and fighting instinct kept O'Sullivan going. When he got away from the ropes, the champion came after him, and the title moved further out of reach as the contender sank to the floor.
six rounds to go. Tawi are in for the kill and the fight looks all over as O'Sullivan is down again. But that Cockney lad has a fighting heart and again rises too soon. But for all his grand display of courage, the end can't be far away. Going down again, he stayed down this time to take a rest. But the fleeting seconds were not enough to give back the strength to keep him out of trouble. Then came his 20th knockdown in 10 rounds. The mere fact that he was still capable of rising to his feet must temper the knowledge that the world title is forever beyond his reach. It came as a relief to Danny and spectators alike, and to Victor Will more than anyone, when Danny O'Sullivan's handlers signified defeat at the end of round 10. Recognition from the gamest of game losers that Victor Will is still a great world champion. He had uh, tremendous reflexes. I think that was the big thing. He could pick a punch coming very easily. He didn't get hit all that much. Oh, even with his attacking style. Sure, he did get hit a few times, but uh, in his world title offences where he fought good men like Luis Romero, Peter Keenan, uh, clever campaigners, he was able to go completely different because Romero was a bull like himself, just kept coming at him. Keenan was a, a crafty boxer, and yet he could work out both men with ease in the ring. The man was tremendous in that uh, he had an inner strength which you don't find in many fighters. He just kept going and going. And the tragedy, of course, was that he had the weight problems in the latter stages of his career. And I think without those, he could have gone on longer. But the weight eventually pulled him right down. Although scoring another eight consecutive victories, including two very impressive world title defences, Vicky was struggling more and more to make the bantamweight limit, as well as suffering occasional attacks of double vision. He wanted desperately to retire but was lured back to make a fourth defence of his world title, which he lost on a devastating first round knockout. His opponent, the Australian southpaw, Jimmy Carruthers. He was at that time, I promise you, I think it was 149 pounds, and he had to come down to 118. And we had only two weeks to get that weight down. And all he had hanging for time to get the weight down, he battled like mad. Carruthers was good, but he wasn't that good. Carruthers wasn't in the, uh, the mould of uh, an autist or uh, even a Luis Romero, who uh, gave Vicky's hardest fight as, a, as champion. No, I think if it wasn't for weights, he'd have, he'd have beaten uh, Carruthers. If you, remember, the, in the return fight, I mean, the first fight was a bit of a debacle as far as it went, one round. But in the return, he went 10 rounds. He was struggling in the end, and those were 15 round fights in those days. He was struggling, and you could see that weight reduction was dragging on him. No, I think he could have beaten Carruthers if uh, he hadn't pulled weight like that. After losing the rematch against Carruthers, Vicky had two more fights and then retired from the ring, leaving a legacy of courage, determination and skill seldom seen in the professional arena. He was 26 years old and set for life. I'd like to see another one like him come out tomorrow. I think that would electrify the game. The, the boxers today, often too cushioned. Uh, promoters are inclined to give them too many stiffs, if we can call them, pushovers, easy ones. Vic didn't have that. He came up the hard way. I mean, and he's winning the world title in his 14th fight and along the road he met guys like Stan Rowan for the Commonwealth title he was in with chaps like Ronnie Clayton who was a darn good fighter uh, he went in with Tony Lombard out here a couple of times and that was a real bruiser he never had an easy one he came up the hard way and I think that's the way the real good fighters come up you look around today and you look at some of the bantamweights we have with all due respect I think he could have been one of the I think he would have been the undisputed champion of the world today one of the greatest bantamweights of all time, of all time, and that includes anybody in the world. Uh, a tremendous fighter, and uh, a very good example of what should be done by any sportsman in keeping themselves in trim, because he was a gymnasium man all the way through. Always training, always hard at work. The name of Victor Anthony Tawil will always be indelibly inscribed in the annals of South African boxing history. It can be debated as to who was the greatest world champion we've ever had, but Vicky Tawil was the first. Manuel Ortiz graciously congratulates the newly crowned champion Vic Tawil, bantamweight champion of the world.